Good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Are you guys blessed? As I am blessed to see all of you here, those in person and online, I'm glad that you uh, are able to join us uh, this morning's service. And uh, as we begin our service today, let's all rise as we uh, sing about the grace of God. All right? I know that we've, we are going through a lot, I mean, for the last few years and at this present time, but we know for a fact that God is always there to give us the grace to be able to make it through. Amen? So here we go. You guys can clap along to it. Good morning. There we go. 
Anybody awake out there? Awesome. We can still set more seats up. It's not a problem. Just let us know if you need more room. No, that's going to fill up. They're just a little late today because they're doing something else on their way. It's bad traffic. That's it. Is everybody ready to worship? All right. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, it's now, let's see, what, 1037. Is anybody hungry? <laughs> How about a double-double from in and out Something good. special from Paul's place. <laughs> Paul's place, everything's fantastic there. Your favorite pizza place. Go get a, sli- get a slice of pizza. Don't go. Get a slice of pizza. Hungry yet? You know, when you're hungry, you don't have to find time to eat. At least I don't. When your stomach is growling, hungry people don't wait for food to happen. When you're hungry, you adjust your life to make time for a meal. Or in my case, cookies, junk food. Now, think about this. What about spiritual hunger? How's your spiritual hunger today? God wants us to go deeper in intimacy with Him. We've let ourselves feel satisfied when God wants us to just get hungrier and hungrier. The Bible declares over and over again that God feeds hungry people. Are you hungry for the spiritual renewal of God's promises? When athletes want to move to the next level, the coach asks, How hungry are you? How bad do you want this? One way doctors determine how healthy are is they, do you have a good appetite? Are we healthy? Do we have a good spiritual appetite? So if that's the case, how then do we explain Christians who have no spiritual appetite or a nominal spiritual appetite? We don't have the hunger for God. Hunger is the prerequisite for spiritual passion. The Bible shows us many helpful pictures on how that hunger manifests itself. One example, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was so hungry to see Jesus that he set aside his dignity dignity to do it and climbed up in a tree. Are we that hungry to where we would climb to the highest heights to receive spiritual hunger? food. Perhaps our problem today is that we are not really hungry yet. We aren't desperate. Because when you get hungry, you take desperate measures. Some of us do. And you don't care who's watching. Zacchaeus didn't care that the crowd watched him climb that tree. What made Zacchaeus different from the rest of the crowd that day was Zacchaeus had something deeper going on. He was hungry for forgiveness. He was starving because of his sin. Zacchaeus gave up his dignity to go get a look at Jesus because he was hungry for what Jesus could feed him. Today, God is looking for our growling stomachs, spiritual growling stomachs. He's looking for people whose spiritual insides are rumbling for him. The reason many of us aren't hungry inside like we should be is because we are full of the wrong things. We've satisfied ourselves with snacks instead of the good food. God doesn't want us content with our spiritual fast food. Something you can just pick up and gulp down while you continue to do your other business. He wants you to come and dine at his table Many of us don't feel spiritually hungry because we've taken things into our minds and hearts that get in our way. We don't feel as needy for spiritual food as we really are. Sorry, I'm preaching. The hungrier for God you are, the more intimate you are with him. The more intimate you are with God, the more capacity you have. And the more capacity you have, the more power and passion you can experience through God. So are we truly hungry for Jesus Christ, our Lord? 
ask that you think about this as you stand, or you already stand, if you would stand with us, please, if you can. And as we sing, hungry.
morning, Victory. How we doing? Okay, we can do better than that. I'm going to say it again, and I want it to be so loud that we're going to wake up some angels in heaven. How we doing? Hey! Hey, that's better. That's better. So a very special morning to everybody who's gathered here today. Uh, good morning, except for one group of people, Philadelphia Eagles fans. You guys are playing my Buccaneers today, so I hope you have a, a little bit of a bad morning. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> But before I kick off the announcements, I want to share a very special, uh, special thing that's happening today. Our fearless leader, Josh over there, it's his birthday. So let's all gather Yay. and wish him a very happy birthday. And we're going to do a little bit better than that. Pastor Chris is going to lead us in a little something. All right, let's sing, Josh, a happy birthday. Thank you, Josh, for all that you do here at Victory. Thank you for all that you do, Josh. You're awesome. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and kick off the announcements. So the first item we're going to be talking about is going to be the consecration of the new ministry land at 227 North Magnolia. That's going to be this Saturday. It's already coming up. So please attend. It's going to be at 10 a.m. We're going to pray over the land. I was uh, talking to Jim about this uh, before our service started, and I have a very strong belief and a lot of faith that as soon as that ministry center is built, it's going to be like a rocket ship, and we need to be prepared for the challenges that we're going to face because we're going to have a lot of opportunity as well. A lot of people are going to see that beautiful new building and are going to want to know Jesus. So let's be prepared, and the way we prepare is through prayer. So please join us in that endeavor. Next up is going to be team night. That's going to be January Thursday. I apologize. January 27th. That's a Thursday at 6.30 p.m. I always talk about if you're not plugged into the church, please attend, which is very important, but I want to switch gears a little bit. If you are plugged into the church, if you do serve in some capacity, it's incredibly important for you to attend team night as well. Make, a, make the effort, just go ahead and attend that one meeting. And let's hopefully we can change your mind about regular attendance because it's incredibly important. Another part that I'm gonna switch gears a little bit about, if you're sitting and you're thinking, man, we can do something a little bit better in this church. Like that guy, Morgan, and does the announcements? I don't know about him, I think I can do better. That's awesome, I would love to talk to you about that. And let's not hold good ideas or possible adjustments to ourselves. Let's gather as God's people and let's build each other up. And that happens at Teen Night. And next up is going to be the First Steps training. That's going to be Saturday, February 12th at 10 a.m. So say somebody gets brought to faith and what then? Somebody's accepted Jesus. That's amazing. But how do you equip that person to be able to minister, to be a saint, to be able to spread the good word in, in, in of themselves. That's a very hard task to do. And the way that we're trained to do that is through discipleship. Our goal here at Victory is to have 100 trained disciples. So let's go ahead and let's uh, work up to those numbers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. So let's uh, take a time and think about... Um, worshiping the Lord with our tithes and offerings, all right? Tithes and offerings. Uh, tithe, the word tithe, means one-tenth. And I like to think of it as not 10%, but 90%. Why? Because, you know, all of it belongs to God anyways, right? He lets us keep 90%. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So uh, tithes and offerings, now's the time. We have... Uh, many ways to give. You can drop off your offer, offering in the, the back uh, offering box in the back. Uh, you can also go online and uh, to our website, which is uh, victoryanaheim.org, and there's a donate button right there for you to connect to our secure donation website. All right, and everything can be done electronically, and you can uh, set it up for recurring. You don't have to worry about it, and there it is, right? So uh, that's one way to worship God. There are many other ways, but that's one way, and I think we're called to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy to us, your generosity. Wow, you let us keep 90%. And uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful in this area of our lives, and help us to worship you, uh, worship you with our tithes and our offerings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm back on stage here. Ready for the message? Yes. All right. Well, today we're going to continue our series on encounters with God. Encounters with God. And uh, today's message is from Genesis chapter 35. And this is the latter end of the life of Jacob. So Jacob, he was one of our patriarchs, and he... Uh, the son of Isaac, and Isaac was the son of Abraham. So Abraham was basically Jacob's grandfather, all right? And uh, Jacob had an interesting life. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, they were twins, and of course Esau came out first, and so he was the older brother. And, uh, well, he kind of sold his birthright to Jacob, in a moment of weakness, he said, hey, I'll give you my birthright if you give me some food. It's like Jacob took him on that and said, sure. Well, that kind of got things rolling, and through some circumstances, sure enough, Isaac ended up blessing Jacob with the birthright. So here we are in Genesis chapter 35. Now, if you've walked with the Lord for any time, length of time. Maybe you're a new Christian, or maybe you've been a Christian for many, many years. Uh, you've probably gone through some low points in your spiritual life. I'm sure you have, like all of us have. And the Lord seems kind of distant. And you hit a spot where you seem to get kind of stuck. Stuck. Usually you're not aware of it right away. But at some point you realize... You're just not excited about the Lord anymore like you used to be. Maybe you're still going to church, but, you know, things aren't the same. Maybe you're still reading your Bible, but maybe not. Maybe you're still praying every day, but still you've lost that passion, that first love. It's easy for that to happen after you've been a Christian for many years because things be kind of come the same a lot, right? Maybe you're burnt out from serving in the church, so you kind of kick back and take it easy. Ah, I've been doing this so long, I don't need to do anything. Let the young people do it. Slowly, the air leaks out of your spiritual tires, and you're, you realize you're stuck in a spiritual rut. Stuck in a rut. Have you ever heard that term? I'm stuck in a rut. Well, the ter you, young people might not know what the term stuck in a rut means. It's kind of like the Old West when they had the, 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 the horse, uh, you know, the covered wagons and stuff and those big tall wheels on the dirt roads. You know, they'd keep rolling on those dirt roads. And sure enough, what would happen? Where the wheels are, there would be these deep ruts or like, like a ditch, you know. Um, so if you've ever been on an old dirt road, you've probably seen them, you know, where the all the cars go over there, whatever, and you get these low points. Well, imagine a rut is so deep, you get stuck in it, you can't get out. When you want to, when you want to turn or go, go a different direction, you're kind of like forced to go in the direction of those ruts. I've been a member of Victory Baptist Church since 1987. It's like, whoa. Yeah, I was kind of young back then. I was young. I had lots of energy, right? And here I am today, uh, you know, you know, because this message is kind of like, you know, you know, preachers have this thing, you know, they, they want to preach at the, at the congregation, right? But remember that when you point your finger, you got three fingers pointing back at you. So you better be careful, right? And that's the way it is with messages. Whenever I'm looking at these things, I'm like, this is going to really speak to me more than you guys. So 
This, here it is, right? Stuck in a rut. So I remember back in, in 1987, uh, it was Pastor Robert Knudsen, great preacher. And he would preach this message like stuck in a rut. And he would say, he would go like this, a rut is like a grave with the ends kicked out. I don't even remember that. But he would say that, right? And it stuck to me, you know. Stuck in a rut. In Genesis 35, we find this other encounter with God, you know, as we continue with our series. And it's Jacob. Jacob is stuck in a rut. And kind of God kind of talks to him, says, hey, do this, 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 this. You know, God hasn't talked to him in a long time. If you look back one chapter, God isn't even mentioned in chapter 34. But even go back further. See, J Jacob here was stuck in a rut. And 30 years before, he was in that same spot, by the way. The Lord had met Jacob in a special way at Bethel. Well, he wasn't there when he spoke to him here, but this is where God wants him to be, in the place called Bethel. That's where he was. That's where he was when he, when he fled from Esau. Esau wanted, after Jacob got the, the blessing from, from Isaac, his father, uh, and, and the birthright, uh, Esau, even though he sold him his birthright, I don't, I don't get it. Esau was pretty mad. In fact, he wanted to go and, you know, kill Jacob, he was that mad. So what did Jacob do? He fled from his angry brother. And Jacob made a vow that if God brought him back safely to the land, the land of Canaan, then he would be his God. God kept his part of the deal. Jacob had prospered financially under his father-in-law Laban, in spite of Laban's greed and deception. Jacob had been blessed with 11 sons and a daughter. And after wrestling him into submission at Peniel, the Lord had protected Jacob in his dreaded meeting with Esau and brought him safely back to Canaan. But Jacob stopped short of going back to Bethel, the place of his vow. Whether it was a continuing fear of Esau, maybe? Or maybe he just liked it where he was. At that time, he was in a, a prosperous land uh, uh, called um, Sechem, Sechem, S-E-S-H-E-C-H-E-M. Or maybe there was other factors that kept him from going all the way to uh, Bethel. We can't be sure. But Jacob settled short at the place that God wanted him to be. It wasn't that he abandoned God during those 10 years or so. Now remember, it was 10 years in, in Sechem. Before that, he, was, he served uh, Laban, his father-in-law, for 20 years. <laughs> That's a story in of itself. You know, he, he meets this, the girl of his dreams, and he wants to get the blessing from you know, the girl's father. And God, Yeah, if you serve me for seven years, I'll let you have my daughter. Oh, that's a pretty good deal. So he does. Well, seven years is over, and, uh, you know, Laban tricks him. Here, you can have, he kind of tricks him. I don't know, he, he does this whole swap at the wedding ceremony. I don't know, maybe the veil, who knows. But Jacob didn't even realize it until the next day after everything was over with, that he had the wrong girl, right? He had, um, he had uh, the, do the, the, the sister, Leah, Instead of, instead of uh, uh, Rachel, yeah. So what did he say? He went to Laban and says, look, <laughs> Leah, <laughs> I don't want Leah, I want Rachel. It's like, come on. And he says, well, you did what you did, so you have her, you know, that's the way it is. And uh, so he then says, yeah, work, work another seven years and you can have it. So he spent 20 years with him and working that, and he was very prosperous. And then after that, he went to Sechem for, Sechem, Sechem, Sechem for 10 years. And that's where he stayed for 10 years. Didn't quite go to Bethel. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't that he abandoned God during those 10 years, so he, he, also, he didn't. He was kind of like, you know, still acknowledging God. He even built an, an altar there. Uh, but he went through the outward motions. Uh, the reality of going all the way back to Bethel where he made the vow uh, had kind of faded. 
Now, Jacob went through this decade of being stuck in a rut, kind of like, uh -uh. and it kind of didn't go well for him there. Ultimately, it led to his one and only daughter being raped. And then the, the other, the, the, his sons kind of got together and kind of murdered uh, the men of the city. And they, they were against him, right? So he was having a really bad time there towards the end. You know, the, 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 the trick isn't getting stuck in a rut. We can all get stuck in a rut. In fact, we probably all have been stuck in a rut, or maybe you're stuck in a rut right now. Most of us have done that without much trouble. The trick is getting out. How do you start growing again? And Genesis 35 shows us how Jacob began to grow after getting stuck. In a nutshell, listen to this, we get out of a spiritual rut by responding obediently to God's word. God spoke, and Jacob responded obediently. Now, there's four facets. I'm going to go, kind of go through them uh, quickly for time's sake. I wish I could spend a lot more time. This, maybe this is a two-part uh, two lesson. Who knows? But let's just go through it. The first part is this. Obey God's commands. Obey his present commands. What he's telling you to do now, obey it. Look at Genesis 35.1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your, the face of of Esau, your brother, command, hey, don't get stuck here. Go. Just get up and go. You know, this should, this should encourage anyone that's in a spiritual rut. After the events of chapter 34, uh, the, all the things of Asechim, Sechem, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, you would have expected the Lord to say, Jacob, that's it. You and your family have messed up once too often. I chose you to be a blessing to all nations, but instead you deceived them and you slaughtered them even. I'm going to find someone else to be my covenant people. But the Lord didn't do that. Instead, he graciously said to, to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel and live there. Make an altar there who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. That's encouraging. God wants us to come back to him and grow even after a decade of being stuck in a spiritual rut, even after a disaster like Genesis chapter 34, like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. The Lord is looking for his strayed children to return to him. He wants you to come back. He's not condemning you. He has open arms. His grace should motivate us to respond obediently to him. Perhaps you're thinking, it's great that God spoke to Jacob, but God hasn't spoken to me. But he has. First, bow your heart before him and confess your spiritual apathy or I don't care kind of attitude. And then open your Bible and ask him to speak to you from his word and show you what to do, and he will. And then do as Jacob did. Obey. Look at verse 2. And Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. He's ready to, he's ready to get, get on the move here, right? Uh, one way you'll know that the Lord has spoken to you is you'll have an immediate sense of need for personal and family cleansing. When God speaks to you, and you know you're stuck in a rut, and you know you're kind of in the low point of a spiritual, God speaks to you, you know what? The first thing you're going to think is, you're going to look at, you kind of look in the mirror and say, what's going wrong here? And you're going to want to clean things up. That's the first reaction that you get when you go, you know what? I'm going to straighten things up, and I'm going to get out of this rut, and I'm going to do something. What's the first reaction? Clean up your act, right? You want to clean up your act. You want to look around and say, what's going on here, Right? You'll be aware that there are things that you've allowed into your life that just have to go because they're not as pleasing to God. As soon as God told Jacob to go back to Bethel, he had to do some spiritual house cleaning. Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. God didn't have to tell him to get rid of the idols. Jacob knew that if he was going to meet with God, there had to be a cleansing. 
He couldn't let his family haul their idols to Bethel. What about your idols? Well, that's the number one family on earth at this time, right? This is God's lineage. This is the chosen people. Israel, you know, Jacob. Well, you know, Jacob is Israel. He was later renamed to Israel. The Lord has been working with Jacob for over 30 years and with his father and grandfather before him. And yet they were discovered that his family is loaded with the idols and earrings, which, you know, some sort of idolatrous significance. Who knows? Rachel had stolen her father's household gods. The rest of the family apparently had more of their own idols. Probably they had a few more when they looted Sechem, Sechem, when they went and killed the men of Sechem for uh, their sisters uh, being raped. Jacob had known about it, but he kind of let it ride. Yeah. But he knew about it, obviously. He told him to get rid of them. But when it was time to go to Bethel, he did. He confronted his family's sin. For the first time, we see Jacob taking the proper leadership of his family. You know, it's easier to sit here and think, well, it doesn't apply to me. Right? I don't have any idols. Look at me. I don't have any idols. I'm a Christian. I'm not a pagan. Idols? Yeah, right. But idols are not just little statues that you keep in your house and you bow down and worship. What is an idol? What is an idol? An idol is anything, anything that takes the place of your God. That's right. Anything that takes the place of your God in your life and it blocks you from growing in the Lord and from doing his will. For some, the idol is a career. Career success can be an idol. Doesn't mean that you're in the wrong career, just means maybe your focus is too much on one thing. It's taking the place. Maybe not 100%, maybe 50%, but you're doing too much. Career success is good, but it, can't, it shouldn't be an idol. Everything else, even family, is subordinated uh, to the goal of career success. I mean, you start put everything in the back burner. You don't want to do anything except for focus on your career. You've seen people like that. For others, maybe it's being rich, affluence, right? Collecting all the material junk that the world wants to sell us. Uh, it says, you know what? If you have this, you'll be happy. You want this, it'll make you happy, right? Uh, some worship personal fulfillment. If that... Even if it means divorcing their mate, they want to say, you know what? I have so much to do in my life, I don't need this anymore. And any kind of commitments they've made prior, they kind of leave them. What? It can be an idol. It can be an idol. No time for getting to know their lost neighbors. No time for personal Bible study, family devotions. No time for getting to know the people in your church even. They're too busy to work with the church. They're too busy to do things, maybe help with the youth. They're too busy. Why? Because something's taking the place, and that's called an idol. But they've got time for other things, right? Got time for lots of things. TV, movies, things that you want to do, right? Idols. Yep. See the three fingers pointing back at me? We're all guilty. We all need an adjustment. We all need to look at our lives and say, oh yeah, this is an idol. Now it's also easy to sit here and say, you know what? I hope so-and-so is listening to this. That person's such a materialistic guy. But you know what? We need to take the log out of our own eye, like the Bible says in the New Testament. Take the log out of your eye. The most stubborn idol we have to get rid of is ourself. We worship ourselves. Ourselves get in the way. The way to get out of a spiritual rut in response to his grace is obey what God is telling you to do. And don't wait. Do it right now. Number two, fulfill your past commitments. God has begun with Jacob 30 years before Bethel. 
where he had made some commitments to the Lord. That's right. Jacob made some commitments. We talked about those. You know, he said uh, back in uh, chapter 28, actually, I think it's on the screen. It says, Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way, uh, that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And, all, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. You ever make promises to God? Now, these were kind of immature promises, immature commitments in many ways, because Jacob was bargaining with God. If you do this, this, and this, God, well, then I'll just, then you can be my God, all right? In other words, he's like bargaining with God. That's kind of immature, and I think a lot of times we do that. But although immature, God did take Jacob's commitments and began to work with him. He wanted Jacob's obedience and worship. So here, 30 years later, the Lord doesn't mention the house or the 10%, but he does mention worship. He commands Jacob to return to Bethel and fulfill his commitment to worship. Set up the altar there. Come on. Jacob had to return to his original commitment to the Lord. You know, God has a way of bringing us back to the commitments we made to him years before. That's why it's good. You know, it's good to encourage young people to make commitments uh, because, you know what, even though they might not fully understand them, they'll stick. See, God, does, God doesn't forget, right? You know, I was raised a Catholic, and I remember making a promise to God. If he would show himself in some way, then I would follow him and, and, and kind of like what Jacob's doing, right? Well, it never happened. He didn't, I mean, I used to sit there at the window and when it was storming and just, you know, God, if you're listening and, you know, make the rain stop. <laughs> I was just a little kid. I was probably like in first grade or second grade or something like that. You know, because I'd hear, I'd, you know, go to church and you hear these stories and stuff and it's like, eh, didn't work. It's like, mm. but I remember these things in my head, in my mind. God, if you just fill in the blank. God, if you just do this, then I'll do this. Right? Well, it kind of, like I said, it never happened. But many years later, when I was at a low point in my life, God sent me a messenger. That's right. Became one of my dearest friends. His name was Drew. And Drew was instrumental in my return to God. Did God show himself? I believe God showed himself in that saint. And it reminded me of that childhood promise. You know, if you show yourself, if you make yourself real in my life, then I'll serve you. And Philippians 4.13 became real to me. And I renewed my faith in Christ, and it changed the direction of my life. I would not be here if it weren't for Drew. Most of us make commitments to the Lord early in our relationship with him. Maybe you make a commitment at camp or at a church service. Maybe it was in a crisis when you promised the Lord that you would, you know, get at, get him, if he would get you out of a jam, you would do this, this. Nah, if, you, if you just fix this problem, Lord, then I'll, I'll just, I'll do this, right? And whatever, fill it in. Kind of like marriage, you know. You need to go back to your original commitment. Remember when you first fell in love and, and she said yes, and you had that romance, right? Now you've been married 25 years, and it's like humdrum. Go back. Renew all that stuff. Why? Because it's good to do that. And it's the same spiritually. Isaiah 25, 1. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. You've got to rekindle the romance you used to have with God. Get alone with him. And tell him that you love him. Tell him that you love him. Clean out the junk in your life that's gotten you off track. Think about the things that you have promised to do for him that you just kind of didn't keep. Recommit yourself to do them now by his grace. That leads us to the 
Third factor. Much of this chapter focuses on God's past and continuing mercy to Jacob. God's past mercy in protecting him from Esau is mentioned three times in this chapter, chapter 35. Uh, one of which is verse 7, and he says, And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. See, the Lord is merciful, protecting Jacob through those 30 years while he was away, while he was sidetracked in a sense, while he was in a rut. He's protected. And when the Lord appears to Jacob again in Bethel, he doesn't say much new except that things shall come forth from him. Everything else has been revealed before. The Lord confirms Jacob's new name even. And God said to, said to Jacob, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your new name. So he called his name Israel. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and your descendants after you, I give this land. So here's God renewing his commitment to Jacob and to his family. He reveals to Jacob his name, El Shaddai, but that wasn't new. Abraham, Isaac, they knew God. They knew God by that name. It means God Almighty, El Shaddai. In fact, the word El is God. So Israel is, uh, has, is, means fight, uh, fighter of God. One who fights with God. Like. That's what he named him. As a reminder of how God wrestled with him and finally got him back to this point. The Lord goes on to remind Jacob that he will keep the promises he gave years before to multiply Jacob's descendants and give him the land. He sets up a pillar and pours out his offering on it. And even the list of Jacob's 12 children are mentioned in... Uh, or his sons, and then two uh, grandsons are mentioned in this chapter. You know, sometimes we think to get out of a spiritual rut, we've got to discover some new spiritual truths. But you see, God was reminding Jacob of all these things that they already, he already knew. Isn't that the case with us? We don't need something new. We just got to do what we know. Right? We don't need a new, like, revelation. Oh, I didn't know that before. Now I'm really going to serve God. No. Usually all we need is to be reminded of the old truth we already know. We need to remember God's uh, past and continuing mercies toward us in Christ. All those passes he gave us throughout. And remember that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's one reason frequent observance of the Lord's Supper is important. You know, God is so kind. God He's the one who has the unlimited mercy, who gives us uh, unlimited grace, who forgives us, who empowers us. Romans 2.4 says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? God is so good. You should want to serve him. So to get out of that spiritual rut, we need to obey God's present commands, fulfill our past commitments, and remember God's continuing passion. There's a fourth element. I'm just going to skip through this really fast because I'm out of time. But you see, Jacob kind of faced, uh, I don't know, some hard times even after this. Tragedies in his life. Tragedies. There was four big tragedies. There was... Uh, the first one was the death of Deborah. Deborah was uh, a nurse, Rebecca's nurse. And so he's very close. And the fact that she was there, I mean, she was there when, she was probably there when, uh, when, when Jacob was born too. I mean, she was, 
she's probably old by now, probably like 170, but she dies, and she was very close to the family. And uh, in Genesis 35, 8, it says, now Rebecca, uh, now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the uh, terebinth trees. The name of it was called uh, Alon Batchuth. So there was mention of it and how, it, uh, how he uh, cherished her. And then after that, uh, his, his beloved wife Rachel died, uh, mentioned in chapter 35 there. And then third, the third Tsar, the third tragedy, came after Rebekah's death. And it says it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. What did, what did, who was Reuben? Reuben was Jacob's firstborn. And it, uh, that didn't end up so well. In fact, we learn later towards the end of Genesis that uh, Reuben was kind of shut out of his birthright. Kind of like it rolls in the family there, doesn't it? And then finally, Jacob loses his father, Isaac, who died. So there's tragedies in his life. And uh, you think, well, you know, after he turned that corner and after he recommitted and after he got straight and after he went there and, and followed uh, God and, and he, you know, he went to uh, Bethel and he built that altar, I mean, everything should have been roses. But you know what? It doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out that way. You know, and through these tragedies, it doesn't say it exactly in the text, but there are hints that Jacob bore all of these trials with renewed truth or trust in God. And uh, we can go into the details, but he was still committed. He was still committed. The point is that getting out of spiritual rut doesn't guarantee that life ahead will be rosy. Obedience doesn't mean a trouble-free life. But in the inevitable trials that God uses to shake us out of our spiritual indifference and to keep us trusting him, we have the God of Jacob. God is our refuge. God is our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. You know, it's significant that in chapter 34, where he had most of his troubles, it's all of its sin. God is not mentioned once. I said that. But in chapter 35, God is mentioned 11 times. And if you count the names of the uh, children, he's mentioned 12 more times. Trials can either make us self-focused or God-focused. In a trial, we get all focused on ourselves. But we should be focused on God. Because he's the one who gives us comfort, and he's the one who carries us through. If we allow the trials to help us put God back in the rightful center of our lives, we'll recover from being stuck in a rut, as Jacob did. And to close, I want to say there was this story, and it's kind of funny. Uh, there's this old legend, uh, a rabbi used to say it, about a man named Simon. He goes, there's a man named Simon who lived in Krakow, Poland. Simon repeatedly had this vision, this vivid dream in which there was a great treasure buried under a bridge in Prague, many, many miles away. But being a poor man, he couldn't get there. But he did decide finally to make the long trip. He made the long trip to Prague in search for his treasure, which constantly plagued his vision. When he arrived, he went to the bridge, and there he saw a guard, a sentry, saw him probing around and looking under the rocks and looking for what he thought would be the treasure. And Simon told the sentry about his dreams and his long, long journey all the way from Krakow to Prague. You foolish man, the, the sentry replied. Don't you know that you can't believe your dreams? I too have dreams. I had a dream that there was a man in pra Krakow named Simon who had a treasure buried beneath his kitchen stove. But I've never been so dumb to go there in search of it. Now get along. So Simon returned back to his town, Krakow, and sure enough, looked under his kitchen stove and discovered a treasure. 
which enabled him to live comfortably for the rest of his life. The rabbis always ended the story by saying this, the treasure was always in Krakow, but the knowledge of it was in Prague. You know, sometimes the very thing we're looking for is right under our noses, but we've got to go the long, hard way around to discover it. That's the way it was for Jacob. He had a long life, a long, hard life, and God brought him through with many successes, but a lot of the failures and stuff were his own doing. And you think, well, you know what? If he just did the right thing up front, he could have avoided all that. Probably true. But that, all those things made him who he was, made his commitment to God that much stronger. God brought him through that. We, we have all of God's treasures in Jesus Christ and in the written word which reveals him. God, he is our El Shaddai. He is the all-sufficient one. He is who we need to follow. Sometimes God uses a spiritual rut to make us wake up to the riches that we've been right under our noses all the time. If you've been stuck in a rut, time to get out of it. How? By responding obediently to God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, all that you do for us. You are so gracious. And God, we love you for that. And for those of us, Lord, who are stuck in ruts, help us to see our way out by focusing and turning our eyes to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
If anybody has accepted Jesus today, I want to congratulate you for making the best decision you've ever made in your life. And I want to welcome you to the family of God. If you have any questions, let's follow up on that. Let's have a conversation. Feel free to pull one of our church leaders aside. As we look onto this upcoming week, I'd like to share something that really convicted me. It was one of those things where you're just driving and then God just kind of gut punches you. And you kind of have to reflect on that a bit. So it's a question. Do we serve an ordinary God? Do we? Of course not. So why do we act like we do? And that killed me. Why are we satisfied with the humdrum of life when we are called to be extraordinary, like our God is extraordinary? We are called to rise above. We are called for so much more than what we are doing now. Let's get there.